Okay, fabulous. So I have the pleasure of introducing the keynote today, which will be delivered by uh, Dr. Christos Teretsis and Dr. Lydia Petridou. So Dr. Lydia Petridou is a professor of the Hellenic Open University in Patras, Greece. Her interests focus on the areas of ancient, philosophy, ancient Greek and Byzantine philosophy with her postdoctoral research at the National and Cappadocian University of Athens, having focused on Nicholas of Methoni and his refutation of Proclus's elements of theology. She has published both in Greece and abroad six monographs and books and more than 50 scientific articles with topics drawn from ancient Greek philosophy and Byzantine philosophy and theology. Dr. Christos Teretsis is a former professor of ancient Greek and Byzantine philosophy at the University of Patras, former director of the postgraduate program of the Hellenic Open University Studies in Orthodox Theology, and former dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences of the University of Patras. He has twice received awards from the Academy of Athens, as well as twice been a partner with UNESCO. Alongside 250 scientific articles, he has published both in Greece and abroad 27 monographs and books and topics drawn from ancient Greek philosophy and Byzantine philosophy and theology. In 2020, Dr. Teretsis, along with Dr. Petridou, published a book with St. Sebastian Press on George Pachymeris' Paraphrasis of Pseudodionysius in the Areopagites De Divinis Nominibus. So without further ado, we turn it over to the two of them. As I understand, they're going to be making a joint presentation. And after that, we'll follow with hopefully about 20 minutes of questions uh, as we've been doing this morning. So please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming both Dr. Teretsis and Dr. Petridou. Dear professors, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I and Professor uh, Teresis are uh, grateful for this invitation. It is a great honor for us to have the opportunity to elaborate this great question, which brings us before a comparison between Christianity and Neoplatonism on the transition from the divine transcendence to the divine immanence in Dionysius and Proclus. Uh, unfortunately, due to unexpected work commitments, Professor Teresis could not be here with us, so allow me to represent both. Um, in the 5th century AD, philosophy is dialectically connected with theological and metaphysical questions, rationality with religiosity, respectively. It is an era in which religious acts, mystical ceremonies, and theurgies are quite widespread in order man to express himself in both Neoplatonism and Christianity, though in a different way. In this particular historical moment, man seeks spiritual redemption in the metaphysical world and attempts within a context of social introversion to be united with the divine. Proclus and Dionysius the Arapagite express these tendencies, each of them from their point of view, uh, and in this way they define with precision the cultural spirit of the 5th century AD. Our reference to these two thinkers is not accidental, as they both have a special place in the history of philosophy. Proclus is one of the last exponents of the ancient Greek philosophy, while Dionysius is placed in the Christian world, which has already raised critical questions for the scholars. But the big question is what are the common points and what are the differences between the two thinkers? The answer to this question leads also to investigate, as far as possible, the limits of the specific content of the Neoplatonic and Christian theories during that crucial historical period of development of the spiritual life. We need to mention in the first place that the relationships between the two thinkers are impressively extensive and cover almost all theoretical philosoph philosophical fields in a theological sense. So, we find uh, common points between them in the disciplines of metaphysics, cosmology, epistemology, aesthetics, and ethics. Focusing on the philosophically supported theological direction which they have both chosen, we would contend that both are monists. In other words, they form their own theory, relying on the basic principle that the one good is the source of all that exists. However, this is where we see a major difference between them, for the Neoplatonic philosopher and theologian embraces polytheism, while the Christian thinker embraces monotheism. 
but they both accept henology or metaphysical ontology as the foundation of all the ontological processes, or else they accept, apart from the transcendent side of the one good, also its emanating manifestation, or in other words, its productive nature, which according to them is manifested intentionally. This position leads them to elaborate the concept of multitude as an emanating development, which is not considered as a neutral ontological action, but as a personal one. But what each of them means when using the concept of multitude, and by extension, how do they define the relationship of the one good with uh, this multitude in order to prove the way in which henology is manifested? Their theories brings us to the concept of intermediate realities. But how could we explain and interpret these intermediate realities? And how could we prove their archetypal character? In this theory, we can identify, despite the differences, one of their main points in common. But in order to specify the type and extent of the relationships between Proclus and Dionysius regarding their theories on the intermediates and their archetypal character, it is necessary to define a general frame of, of principles. In this way, we will be able to provide some answers to the following questions. What are the ontological texture and functions of the intermediate realities? And what is the kind of their archetypal character in Proclus and Dionysius? At this point, however, some more questions can be raised, such as what is the meaning of the triadic processes and relations in the works of the two thinkers? And on what cognitive and methodological principles do they base the foundation and operation of their theories? The first question has to do with the structural articulation which they choose, while the second is related to the principles with, uh, which they adopt. Uh, we shall attempt to answer these questions on the basis of what Proclus discussed in the third book of Theologia Platonica and Dionysius in his De Divinis Nominibus. Um, when we refer to intermediates, we mean the ontological realities and the divine powers which mediate for the accomplishment of some particular functions and processes. They intervene between the supreme ontological principle and cause, that is the one good, and the multitude of the sensible beings. And since they are numerous, they contribute to the articulated rational organization and action of the produced world. In the Theologia Platonica, Proclus connects his theories on intermediates and archetypes with the content of the ontological categories of the second hypothesis of Plato's Parmenides. The intermediates in Proclus' system are divine realities which express with their presence and their function the pre-existing exodus of the one good from itself and the gradual specialization of its productive function through specific theogonic and creating substance triadic processes. These procedures follow the principles of the triadic dialectical emanatic production scene, remaining procession reversion. Proclus puts in a hierarchy the intermediates according to the ontological and evaluative priority of their essence. This hierarchy also determines their archetypal nature and range. So, the divine intermediates are not only the archetypes of sensible entities, but they also function archetypically in the relationships between them. The hierarchically superiors are the archetypes of the hierar hi hierarchical inferiors. In their highest expression, these intermediates are the henads, which express the divine or the absolutely uniform multitude and are a priori integral plans. This means that the transcendence of the divine henads is such so that to be manifested. It should be mentioned that despite the fact that we are in a polytheistic frame, and despite the fact that the Henats are considered to be gods, they are actually the energy modes in which the one good appears. Or, in other words, for the Neoplatonic finger, the one good is the supreme divine essence, which is manifested through its energylessness, the Henats, but since Proclus adopts polytheism, he calls them gods, for they specify the absolute god. In Dionysius, the intermediates do not follow triadic productive processes, but they simply receive and transmit functions. In his writings, there are two intermediate hierarchies, 
that of the hyper essential processions of the one good and that of the celestial angelic beings. The first is ontological, constitutes the productive and archetypal and paradigmatic condition of the second and expresses the quality and range of the ontological gifts which uh, the one good provides to being. The second hierarchy is functional and is considered that it expresses the pre-existing transmission from being to being of the divine somehow orders received from the processions of the one good. Focusing on the divine processions, we could also contend here that it is about the energies of the one good, or in other words, about its productive side. But since the Christian thinker adopts monotheism, the divine processions, although they are God's energies, are not considered as particular gods, as in Proclus, but as the productive divine way in which the entire created world is produced. Either it is about the angelic entities or about the beings which fall under sensory experience. In this case as well, the transcendence of these divine processions is ontologically of this kind, so that to be manifested, not however in terms of necessity. The common point so far between the two thinkers in their theory of the intermediate is that, is that on the one hand, they attempt to explain and interpret the transition from the indivisible one good to the multitude of the existent. And on the other hand, they consider in this course Proclus the Henouts and Dionysius the processions as divine powers or energies of the one good. In both cases, the one good is manifested intentionally since it is independent of any mechanistic process. Regarding the content and meaning of the triad processes and relationships, we have to mention that there is a clear difference between Proclus and Dionysius. In Proclus's system, all the ontological and functional processes and relationships in the divine level are developed in a triadic way. The one good provides the ontological hypostasis to the, the, the divine entities in a triadic way, and these are produced, self-produced, and produced in a triadic way uh, following the dialectical model remaining procession and reversion. The triadic structure model of all that exists allows us to identify among Proclus's beings the variety of their associations as well as their ontological functional and evaluative gradation and specialization, which according to his descriptions could be characterized hierarchical as well. In Dionysius' writings, there is not an analogous triadic model of ontogenetic process coming through various levels. All that exists is produced once and as a whole, without this general manifestation excluding following special ones, by the processions or powers of the one good. But under this condition, between the produced beings, there are no ontological relationships, but only factional ones. The special position of the celestial angelic hierarchies is not defined according to the differences of their substance or their ontological priority, but exclusively by their degree of participation in the gifts of the processions of the one good and by the difference in their factions. So having in mind the factions, we do find triadic processes in the following way. A, the plans of their manifestation are developed within the divine processions or energies, and this is remaining. B, this manifestation is received by the angelic orders and is spread over all the produced beings, and this is procession. And C, through the reception and application of this manifestation by the angels and the human beings, their reversion to the divine takes place. Attention is required here, uh, however, uh, to the fact that the divine manifestation mentioned is not ontological, but a projection of the modes of being. The purely ontological belongs to the divine processions uh, or energies, which add creative qualities, which are assimilated by the created beings, which in this way reverse to their souls. In this process, there is no worldly mediation. Finally, regarding the relationships between the processions of the one good, we cannot find any form of triadic process since they do not relate with each other and they do not relate with any reality to create all that exists. On the contrary, we see this cooperation in Proclus who gradually connects the Henats ontogenetically and in a triadic way with the true beings which derive from them and subsequently 
uh, these transcendent beings one another so that each of them appears its time. Quite important uh, are the differences between Proclus and Dionysius regarding the cognitive and methodological principles on which the two uh, of them found and developed their theories with apophatism, however, being a given when it comes to uh, divine transcendence. More specifically, Proclus attempts to build uh, his worldview using a perfect conceptual framework, a solid sequence of associations and unchangeable methodological principles. These uh, choices make him, within Neoplatonism, the greatest systematic philosopher. Proclus also bases his work on scientific hypotheses. He chooses a scientific method and uses the same scientific data which he adjusts in the special ontologi ontological cases uh, which he discusses its time. In particular, he uses direct propositions or principle and syllogistic models proved according to those propositions. Direct propositions are unprovable. That is, they're acceptable for their truth and accuracy. They exist by nature, that is a priori, and unconditionally in the human soul. They're not originally composite and they constitute the foundations for apodictic reasoning. He develops his metaphysical theory based on these principles. Moreover, the science of principle is for him theology, which in his view is the Platonic philosophy to which he adds a mystical character as he frames it with the theology of Orpheus, Pythagoras and the Chaldean words. In this polyprismatic theoretical model, he contends that the Platonic diary of Parmenides stands at the top, which epistemologically defines the particular theoretical processes in his work as interest of the Neoplatonic philosophers. In Dionysius, the issue of the, of the methodological principles is remarkably simplified. The Christian thinker does not apply, at least regarding the precise announcement of his intentions, a scientific method. He does not originally rely on scientific data, and the only source for the truth is for him the logia. That is to say, the Christian texts through which God's word are given to human beings. So Proclus's methodological principles and to some degree, the epistemological premises of Plato's Parmenides are not so obvious or clear, clearly defined in his work. It is characteristic uh, that is uh, in the first chapter of the divine names in which he states his interpretative principles for dealing with his subjects, he radically denies any autonomous apodictic process of human thought for expressing and giving meaning to anything that has to do with the transcendent gap. We could even argue that Dionysius keeps in some cases a conscious quasi and philosophical attitude, a choice which is due to his different approach to the term theology. For the Arapa guide, theology is not Platonic theology, but the word of God to man. Finally, we have to mention that in Dionysius, there's not a noticeable scientific perspective since he does not precisely define as a goal to construct and present a perfect theological science. Therefore, we cannot consider his work as a scientific production with the systematic requirement, requirements of organization. In only two cases, Dionysius announces that he will deal with his subjects in a systematic way. On the one hand, when he presents the functional processes which define the type of the relationships between the beings of his angelic and ecclesiastical hierarchies, and on the other hand, when he specifies the details on the question of the processions of the one good. Either way, he originally found his evidence on the divine words. Now, focusing on Proclus, we could contend that this uh, theory of his about the Henals expresses the conclusions which he reads after the systematic critical reconstruction of the position of the early Neoplatonic philosopher with the exception of Syrianus regarding the ontological question which refers to the philosophical and theological interpretation of the content and the relationships between the first two hypotheses of the Platonic dialogue Parmenides. This question deals with ontologically possible and logically acceptable relationships of the one good of the first hypothesis of the Parmenides with the multitude of the produced divine beings of the second hypothesis. For the Neoplatonic philosopher, the solutions to the question are found exclusively in the principle of his theory on the Henats. Uh, 
More specifically, Proclus places the theory of the Henals in the third stage of the apophatic first hypothesis of the Parmenides, in which he has developed in a seminal and potential way, in the sense of a transcendent synthesis, the forms of the productive manifestation of the one good. In this way, he contrives to transform using realities which he places in the henological and metaphysical framework of his system, the apophatic theological content of the first hypothesis of the Parmenides into the affirmative and philosophical content of the second hypothesis, without, however, these predicates being applied with only one meaning. With this transformation, the Neoplatonic thinker intends to define the philosophical classical ontology through his theological metaphysics or henology. His intention is solely served, served by his insistence on elaborating in a strictly structured way the emanating or archetypal character of the Henats in their relationship with the true beings. This elaboration gives him the opportunity to finally succeed in building the hierarchical system of the divine intermediate entities according to the norms as inviolable requirements defined by the theory of the Henats, which define the frame for the development and the function of the true beings. So he will present the Henats not only as the necessary intermediates between the one and the true beings, but also as the self-founding and complete precise causes which intervene with the true beings which they produce and compose the dialectical association of the one multitude in the form of the one being of the second hypothesis of the Parmenides. In this perspective, which has to do with the factionality of his theory about the divine canals, Proclus finally aims to bring into communication the theological and metaphysical content of the first hypothesis of the Parmenides with the corresponding philosophical ontological content of the second hypothesis. Focusing further on how the divine henats are presented, we would also conduct that in Proclus they are not so much divine hypostases as they are the divine productive powers or energies of the one good, while they also express the function of the supreme ontological principles peras apiron, that is limit and infinity. And with this property, they constitute the participated side of the one good. In addition, as we have already mentioned, they function archetypically with regard to the true beings and follow a hierarchical or maybe a successive order which is completely associated with the hierarchical order of the true beings. So as the relation one multitude of the second hypothesis of the Parmenides to be articulated. In the hierarchical order of the intermediate archetypes, the Henats are placed at the beginning and define in completely strict principles what follows. With the term Henat being particularly frequent in his work, we identify intelligible, intellectual, supercosmic, intracosmic Henats, as well as Henats with other predicates and names. In short, in its order of all that exists in a hierarchy, there is a leading Henat. In addition, the term is attributed to the one good, the source of the Henats, which is characterized as Enas Enadon, the Henat of the Henats. In order to avoid the danger of removing the ontological principles of unity and continuity, and by extension dualism, Proclus regards the Henats as the uniform intermediates between the transcendent and unmixed one good and the produced entities. Multiplication does not replace unity, but it specifies it. At this point, actually, Proclus introduces the principle of similarity, which determines the operating conditions of the descending process of procession and the corresponding ascending process of reversion. So, since its productive cause of the second hypothesis of the Parmenides produces, according to procession, the multitude of its effects by similarity, the one good as the original cause must analogously, and of course to the highest degree, produce a multitude most akin to nature with its special nature, that is to say, uniform. 
This position is also in accordance with the principle of the ontogenetic process that the production of the similar precedes the production of the dissimilar. So the one good, according to the type of this emanating necessity, cannot directly produce anything other than the henats, which Proclus presents as having a direct ontological affinity with one and as a similarity of properties with its transcendent nature. Then, since every produced cannot reverse, according to the process of reversion, to its previous ontologically superior level, without the mediation of an entity similar to its nature, but also ontologically superior to it, the true or first beings, which do not present direct similarity to the one good, must reverse to it through the mediation of entities similar to their nature. In this case, the mediating function is once again exercised by the Hernats, which are in a mutual rela relationship with the true beings by being their direct productive archetypal causes, as well as the object of their reductive reference according to the principle of similarity. The same necessity of mediation is generalized and found in every ontological and functional communication of the transcendent one good with a sensible world. Therefore, the Hernats, by emanating directly from the one good and found in its transcendent level, while at the same time, by producing the true beings, they make possible the connection of henology with ontology. In this frame, Proclus' theory of unparticipated participating and participating holds a key role. More specifically, Proclus' works prove that his main goal is not only to preserve ontologically undiminished and unmixed the transcendent nature of the one being, but also to make possible its communication with the true beings. Under these terms and conditions, the existence of a participated side of the one is necessary in which the true beings will participate and by which they will receive their immediate and complete ontological constitution. So the unparticipated and unmixed one good, in order to accomplish without violating the terms mentioned before, to communicate with the true beings, develops its, uh, itself by multiplying and manifests its emanating brains through the henats. Otherwise, not only the content of the second hypothesis of the Parmenides, but also the state of the transcendent synthesis of the first hypothesis, which prepares the emanations, would become ontologically impossible and functionally inactive. But the following needs attention. Although the noticeable difference between the one good and the henats is defined by the fact that the former is unparticipated where the latter uh, are participated, this very participation is descending since the model is monistic. The Hennads are not participated by realities that already exist because such a person would automatically lead to dualism. In other words, the participation is defined first and foremost as a gift and then as a utilization by those hypostases which are formed precisely on the basis of this gift. As a notable difference between the one good and the henats, Proclus mentions that the one good is unparticipated and ontolog ontologically prior, while the henats are participated since they constitute the participated side of it. In other words, regarding their ontological texture, we would say that the henats are not distinguished from the one good as different realities, but they are identified with the participated or causal presence of it as the supreme principle. Let us note that in one case, he contends that the one good produces being having as an intermediate the power which attains to set a relationship which is represented by the henat to which the production has been somehow assigned. This uh, henat helps uh, to the transition from the state of remaining, immobility and unchangeability to the gradual development of the multitude at, as procession that will bring on the metaphysical surface being which corresponds to the intellectual gods and the multitude of the particular uh, metaphysical beings. The procedures are similar in the rest of the ontological categories, for instance, in the case of life, which corresponds to the intelligible and intellectual gods, and in the case uh, of intellect, which corresponds to the intellectual gods. In Dionysius' writings, there is no theory of henats. Here, the term henat 
when it is used, refers to the divine unity and unifying property of the one good or triune God, as well as the unitary property of the angelic orders and remains exclusively in these definitions. So this term, in none of uh, its textual appearance, appearances, expresses a specific divine reality. Dionysius, according to this conceptual limitation, expresses with the term henal, mainly the manifestation of the unifying power of the divine unity, a function that is, of course, also present in Proclus's system, by which the differences that exist in the space of existence are transcended and led to the states of union and harmonious order. Do note here that uh, we should not consider an ontological correspondence between Proclus's Henats and Dionysius' angelic orders, since Dionysius' orders, in contrast to the Henats and the true beings of Proclus, are not ontologically autonomous and do not have productive capability, and certainly they are not divine realities. In other words, they lack any possibility for a self-constituted mode of existence. So some common functional properties between Dionysius' angelic orders and Proclus' canats do not mean ontological correspondences. Furthermore, these properties are possessed in a different way. The henats, which are found in uh, the transcendent level of phenology and constitute the requirements for the structure of ontology, possess their properties in a self-founding way and are related to what follows through them. On the contrary, the angelic orders, as produced beings, receive the properties from the one good through the mediation of the productive archetypal processions, and as intermediary entities, pass them on as modes of being to the following angelic and human orders. The term that puts the divine immanence in the process of realization in Dionysius' text is that of procession, which is used with a broader meaning than that of progress. In particular, procession in the Christian thinker appears to develop on two successive levels with different meaning. That is to say, it is, first, it is first understood as the per se manifestation of the essence of the one good without a direct or necessary objective result, and then as the productive relationship of this manifestation with the created reality. In other words, its development does not automatically mean a specific, a specific productive result. Initially, initially, it is separated from the produced universe. Procession is also not just a technical term expressing only the specific function of the productive movement of the one good. It is a term with real conduct and describes the manner and kind of the energetic manifestation of God's transcendent nature before, through that manifestation, he proceeds to produce the supersensible, that is to say the angels, and the sensible orders of the natural world. Typical of this real meaning of the term procession is that Dionysius also uses its plural form. So he refers to processions which he characterizes with specific ontological terms, such as being, life, intellect, power, to describe the variety, quality, and range of the productive function of the one good, which is manifested exclusively through these external, with respect to its per se conditions, revelations. In Dionysius' writings, the theory of processions relies on the particularly emphasized ontological distinction between the unions and the distinctions of the one good. More specifically, it relies on the distinction between its fixed permanence in its transcendent unmixed essence and its external manifestations. In fact, on an epistemological level, we could argue that the distinction between unions and distinctions leads to both ways of knowing God, the apophatic and the affirmative theology. But Dionysius does not remain in a simple initial distinction between unions and distinctions. He proceeds to a second distinction, distinction uh, within uh, its concept. The result is to have the following picture. One, unions with A, unions and B, distinctions and two, distinction with A, unions, and B, distinctions. So Dionysius defines as unions in the area of unions, the transcendent level of remaining, and in the area of distinctions, the production level of procession. The distinction between the unions of the unions and the unions of the distinctions of the one good, between its remaining and procession, 
corresponds to the distinction that exists between its transcendent and uh, productive uh, level. In this insistence of Dionysius on setting a clear limit between the ontological levels, which are respectively expressed by the unions of unions and the unions of the distinctions of the one good, we find his intention, in intention to distinguish the ancients of the one from its processions, really, and not conceptually or nominalistically. In particular, Dionysius aims with his distinction not only to define the frame of the starting point, the way and the context of the productive, productive movement of the one good towards the multitude of beings, but also and above all to keep its essence ontologically undiminished and unmixed. So he places the processions between the superessential one good and the beings avoid in this way pantheism. Having in mind this intention, he characterizes the processions as wills or distinctions or energies of the essence of the one good, which uh, with their intermediate function, express the type of its externalization and productive movement to towards all beings. By having a volitional character, that is by expressing and not by constituting the essence of the one good, what Dionysius points out is that the processions do not mix it with its productive results. The processions are the productive powers of the one good, and only these are participated by the produced beings without, however, mixing themselves with the products. Do note that the term mixtures appears literally only in dualistic systems. Um, to summarize, the processions of the one good do not belong to the only created space and have not been produced out of nothing as new ontological realities, since unlike the totality of the existence, they derive internally from its transcendent essence and have an uncreated character. We would characterize them as non-produced powers or energies of the essence of the one good, which, however, are distinguished from this essence, and as they constitute its externalization without causing its ontological alteration, belong to the area of phenology and constitute the productive archetypal requirement of the content of ontology. It has already been arisen that the divine essence does not diffuse into the created world, for the processions are the providential or volitional manifestations of the one good. Therefore, the divine essence is ontologically prior to the divine powers or energies as the intermediate source, but these divine powers or energies do not introduce an ontological category into essence, since they are used in the same sense as the processions, that is to say, in a productive or archetypal sense. And of course, the processions all powers or energies of the one good should not be confused with Proclus's self constitute which are gods. As a final remark, we would contend that the processions constitute the natural manifestation of the one good without a necessary productive result, and then they become the productive principles of being. The processions are the one good itself outside of itself, and that is why they are considered as its uncreated energies or powers which do not constitute the ontological determination of its nature, but derive from it as its volitional manifestations. They describe not what the essence is, this cannot be described, but how it is manifested through the processions which are scaled from the most general to the most partial, having as criterion for this distinction only their results. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Petridou. So uh, we invite everyone to turn on their cameras if you would like, if you're able, if you're comfortable. And we have about 15 to 20 minutes for discussion. So you can use the raise your hand function. You can type it in the chat or you can, um, just note, note in the chat that you have a question. So. And Sam, do you want to keep the pen on Dr. Petridou? Uh, yeah, I'll. OK. And then I'll just add a spotlight to whoever else. OK, perfect. All right, Carson. 
Thank you very much for the talk. Um, so I just want to clarify something I wasn't sure about. Is is it the case that the in Proclus the henads are produced by the one good, and for Dionysius the processions are not produced by the one good. Is that is that accurate, or am I missing? Um, in, in order to understand what uh, the real difference between Proclus and Dionysius is uh, in their theory about the intermediate uh, realities, I believe that uh, we have to keep in mind the, uh, this triadic model remaining procession and uh, reversion. Um, in Proclus, remaining is formed uh, in the level of the Henats. The one good is above remaining. Um, the ontological plan is formed within remaining. This ontological plan passes through individual gods which follow a hierarchy. Each one contributes ontologically to the production of the next one directly and indirectly of the ones that uh, follow. Reversion is performed in an analogous way from the direct source to the indirect uh, ones and finally to the henats. This process is polytheistic. Um, that means that the Henats uh, are uh, the, the energy uh, mode in which the one good uh, starts to produce the metaphysical world in order this world to end in the production of the natural uh, world. Uh, since uh, Proclus system is polytheistic, uh, yes, the Henats are um, gods, but uh, uh, since uh, Proclus is a monist, these Henats are uh, the energy modes of the one uh, good, uh, and the term good means that uh, it intentionally and personally uh, produces the Henats, and then the Henats are self-produced and contribute to the production of the next orders uh, in the metaphysical hierarchy. Um, this triadic scheme uh, is also found in Dionysius, but uh, remaining um, in this case is the energy and the processions of the one good, because uh, God uh, stands above remaining, except um, uh, that there is no uh, procedure uh, in which many gods would intervene as in Proclus, uh, since this uh, model is monotheistic. Uh, so uh, in this case, the processions uh, in Dionysus and me, uh, they're not produced, they're the productive side of the one good, they are the productive side of God. In Dionysus, God exists in two ways. Uh, in Proclus's, in Proclus's uh, system, the Henats are the energies as the first produced uh, level of the uh, metaphysical hierarchy. Okay, so the, the processions in Dionysius are productive and, and it's God who's producing uh, through the processions, whereas the henads are themselves the product of the one good, which then go on to themselves produce the metaphysical world in Proclus. So I think I'm understanding the distinction you're making. So thank you. Um, uh, the, the detail that we should keep in mind, uh, in our minds, is that they are both monists. And uh, this uh, makes uh, them have uh, much in common. But then we, when we think that uh, Proclus is a, polythe is a polytheist, well, Dionysius is a monotheist, and uh, then we have a, a more clear picture. Um, uh, 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 for example, uh, the, the term self-constitute uh, is uh, something we see in Proclus, but it's not something we see in Dionysius. So this um, defines everything. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Vincent Devise, and apologies if I mispronounced your last name. It's okay. Uh, Americans, we always say Devise, although I hear it's a Dutch last name, so whatever. Um, thank you so much, first of all, Professor Petrilo, for your presentation. It was very interesting. 
I have, I think, your copy of Proclos um, Elements of Theology on my bookshelf. So it's good to hear from you. Um, what I wanted, the, your last comment is exactly what I wanted to ask about. The, how can we characterize Dionysios as a monist? And I ask precisely because, as you well know, one of the big emphases in modern Greek theology has been the created uncreated distinction, right? Whereas I've seen a number of Western scholars, especially, they want to say that Dionysios is a monist as well. I'm very open to the possibility. This isn't a polemical question. I'm curious, in what sense can we call Dionysios a monist? And could you put that into relationship with this supposedly fundamental patristic distinction between created and uncreated? How can there be monism, but also a fundamental gap between what is God and what is not God? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, uh, for me, it's uh, quite simple. Uh, dualism has to do uh, with uh, who creates the substance. Uh, we see dualism in Plato. Uh, in uh, his Timaeus, for instance, where the demiurge creates, uh, where there is a demiurge and there is a matter uh, that pre exists, and the demiurge uh, uses this matter and his plans to create the world. Um, uh, this version is absent from Christianity. Uh, in Christianity, uh, I believe uh, it is a monist, um, it is a monistic uh, system because. God creates everything among this matter. The plants are the logic of beings in his mind, which um, uh, are realized and uh, um, uh, gain form and receive properties. And all the processions are um, the equal energies, ontologically the same with the um, nature of God, who uh, expresses his productivity uh, intentionally to create everything out of nothing. And this doctrine out of nothing, creation out of nothing, sets the limits between the uncreated and the created. So if there is just one principle and cause who creates everything, even the plants and the matter, uh, no matter if this matter is metaphysical or natural, then this is a monistic model. Okay, that makes sense because sometimes when I hear the term monistic, I think of, I guess, what we would call today a panentheistic model where all created things are essentially on the same continuum, suidiophasma, with, with God himself, you know, and there's no gap between them. And so that's why the term kind of threw me off. We mean it in the sense that there's a single principle from which everything comes. There's no fundamental opposition between God and an eternal matter alongside him or a demiurge that has to come to create. There's Everything comes from that one single source. And in this sense, they're both monists. Um, uh, I understand what you are talking about, but if we see monism in this sense, then uh, we, we will be led in, a, in pantheism. And every creator would, would be God. But in Christianity, um, there's a clear limit. God is uncreated and his essence is uh, totally different from the essence that he creates. And that is why um, I uh, mentioned in my today's uh, lecture that um, God is above remaining and remaining exists into the, these intermediate realities, uh, which we call the processions or energies, uh, where the uh, process of production starts. Okay, yes, thank you so much. Okay, uh, the next question, Sam. Yeah, I, I actually yeah, had a similar question about monism, although I think you kind of touched on uh, resolved it. But I was just wondering about what's the significance of the category of otherness in the context of a monistic picture? Like, would otherness be in some sense um, uh, like a sort of illusory category? Um, I think 
Kuza seems to flirt with that idea in a certain way. But uh, it sounds like that's not really um, the the category, the genuine, uh, you know, like having an ontological status with a category of otherness wouldn't necessarily undermine monism as you've described it, though. So I think um, you've kind of resolved the issue. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Uh, you mentioned a very important word, otherness. Uh, in Greek, it is eterotis. And um, this eterotis uh, has a major difference from the word different or difference. And it is the word that describes the difference, let me say, between the status of God and the status of the created beings. Uh, so God is totally eteros from the beings which he creates. And this is uh, uh, the limit and the safe um, line that keeps God undiminished, unchangeable, uh, and preserve, uh, preserves his divine nature in relation, in relation to the uh, beings that he creates, uh, whose uh, substance is totally created. And this is where monism, but also monotheism comes to the surface. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Father Raymond Snyder. Thank you, and thank you for your paper. I was wondering if you could say a little more about the difference in reversion or return, um, epistrophe, between Proclus and Dionysius, um, at least from you know, I, I may, you may have had a section and in, in which I wasn't paying well enough attention to, but it seems like you were focusing on procession and the differences in their notion of procession um, and self-constitution others. I'm wondering if you might highlight for us some of the, the differences in, in return. Uh, okay. Um, re reversion is a, a course that exists uh, in both of them, Proclus and Dionysius, but in Proclus, um, every um, level of the metaphysical uh, world needs to reverse to the immediate previous and through it uh, uh, following an ascending uh, course to the one good. Uh, and this is because in the metaphysical level, uh, there are uh, multiple scales of gods, and uh, these gods uh, are put in an ontological hierarchy. We mean, uh, we mean an ontological hierarchy, and mm -hmm. every level, every um, uh, uh, team of gods, if uh, mm -hmm. I am allowed to say this, uh, mm -hmm. has a property, and this property... Um, but in Dionysius, um, there, there are no ontological um, levels. Uh, it is what uh, I was talking uh, before, uh, the uncreated God, uh, the created reality. Uh, the only uh, hierarchy, if we can say that, is, uh, has to do with uh, how they utilize the gifts they receive and uh, how they all together um, participate in reversing uh, back to God as a whole. Because God mm -hmm. uh, in Dionysius creates once and as a whole the created worlds. So there are, no, there are no divine levels or even natural levels to reverse success, successively. And mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as the human beings uh, are concerned, um, they reverse to uh, God through their um, moral actions or even through science and how they utilize the um, actually um, intellectual gifts mm -hmm. they have received mm -hmm. or through mm -hmm. their uh, free uh, will and how they utilize their free will mm -hmm. to reverse. Mm -hmm. So uh, to summarize, uh, in Proclus, reversion follows scales, successions, mm -hmm. and one level cannot jump up. It has to uh, go to the immediate previous, while in Dionysius, they all together reverse as a whole. Mm -hmm. It is uh, a little bit simplistic, my explanation, but I hope you have an idea. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. 
Okay, we probably have time for one more question. So, Marcus, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my question has to do with, uh, I guess, monism, but in, in a slightly different way. So, um, you, you characterize the processions as energy or wills that are distinct from God's essence. These uh, processions are not created, though. Do I understand you right? so far no they're not created they're the uh, productive side of god they are uncreated so how is that does that introduce a duality into god the cause i guess on the one hand we have god's essence on the other hand we have his energies and those aren't the same thing but they are somehow in the one source because they're not creatures, the processions aren't creatures, right? Uh, so how can we characterize the processions as being other than God's essence without introducing a duality into God? Does that make sense? No, 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 yes, yes. Uh, uh, no, God, no. Uh, the, 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 uh, God exists in two ways. Uh, let's say he uh, is... Um, before the creation and after the creation, although time is uh, a limit for us, for human beings. But um, you have to keep in mind that the processions are not prioritized uh, in relation to the essence. Uh, uh, the processions or energies are God himself uh, from the moment he decides to create the world. Is that clear now? Um, it's hard to grasp what that means. I think <laughs> they are God in a way, but in a way they're not God. They're not his essence. No, they're not uh, its essence. They are its productive side because uh, we accept that God exists in two ways. And in order to communicate with uh, the world, the created world, or uh, even uh, more, in, in order to create this created world, he has to uh, go in a productive um, uh, movement. So uh, he uh, uh, goes in this productive uh, movement through his energies. The, the energies are the, the projection of his will. Okay, thank you. Okay, that wraps up our keynote. So please join me in thanking Dr. Petridou for delivering this wonderful lecture and for the conversation. We'll take a hour long break, Sam, correct me, and meet back at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's right, yep. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Petridou. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.